uh, same fact came out in 2008. It happened to be on the board of directors of GMHA, and I got the uh, um, the uh, MLO license. And after I got it, I realized that I didn't need to have it. At least that's what our attorney said uh, for the lease option work that we were doing. Still having trouble? You, you can't hear me. Huh? Is it Justin? Justin? Yeah. Yeah. You're good. You're good. Somebody uh, sounded like they couldn't hear it. Too much chatter? Ah, too much chatter. Ah, too much chatter. Okay. If you want to talk, uh, please take it outside. See, now, especially what you got to do is, if you're an attorney, you've got a big enough voice yeah. that you get them all quieted down just by talking real loud. <laughs> I was going to my goal as well. <laughs> okay, so uh, we've been talking about a lease option. Carl Becker is an attorney in Indiana. Uh, George uh, Allen and I met Carl. Uh, actually, George, I guess, had known Carl for quite a while, and I met him a few months ago. Uh, has uh, done some work with uh, lease option, and I asked him at that time, of course, to uh, talk with us here at SECO. Uh, so Carl is going to cover some of the legal aspects of uh, lease option, the most important uh, legal considerations that you need to be aware of. He will be the first one to tell you that these are very technical points. And what we're going to do is to put his presentation up on the website so that you can look at them and look at them and look at them and study them. Because it's very, very difficult to go through what Carl is going to present here in the next 20 minutes or so and, and uh, fully comprehend everything that he uh, tells you. So we'll go through it fairly quickly. Steve, would you give me the first slide, please? Uh, what I wanted to do very quickly, though, is set the stage for what Carl is going to be talking about. So let's just talk for a second about the structure of lease option contracts. An option is the right, but not the obligation to buy the home in the future at a specified amount. You may want to take a picture of that or write it down, but it's the right, not the obligation, to be able to buy the house at a specified price in the future. Now, these terms get confusing. confusing. The option payment is the amount that the person pays for that right. So the option payment is the amount that they pay up front. That's what we think of when we talk about conventional financing as a down payment. The option price is the amount they can buy the house for in the future. So obviously very confusing uh, terms. Option payment is up front. Option price is the price that they can buy the house for in the future. The lease payment, fairly straightforward. That's the monthly lease payment that someone makes uh, to lease the house. And remember, we're only talking about the house, we're not talking about the lot. In our situation, it doesn't have to be this way, but in our situation, the lot payment is due on the first, and the house payment, the lease option payment, is due on the tenth of the month. And the term, of course, is the duration of the lease. It may be five years, it may be ten years, twelve years, whatever, but the term, of course, is the uh, duration of the lease. So here is an example. And again, you may want to write this down. Uh, this is a brand new 16 by 76, three bedroom, two, two, ba two bath house. The option payment, the amount that they pay up front for the right to be able to buy the house is $4,000. The lease amount is $450 a month. The option price at the end of a 10 year term is $9,000. And in our case, we apply the option payment against the option price. So that person at the end of a 10 year term would owe $5,000 more. So Spencer, uh, with that being said, uh, how much is that home gonna be when you purchased it? Because you got the option price set at $9,000 10 years later, correct? Correct. So what was the cost of that house up front? Roughly 40,000. 35, 40,000 in, in that uh, neighborhood. And one of the questions that we're going to ask you after Carl finishes is why is this transaction different from a site built house? Why might this work for a manufactured home when it might not work for a site built or real estate uh, property? So, Steve, if I can have the next slide. So, here are the questions. Uh, we're going to go over these very quickly. 
and we're coming back to them after uh, Coral finishes. What is the status of the resident during the lease term? A buyer, a borrower, or something else? What is the status of the community owner during the lease term? A seller, a lender, or something else? Is the option payment a security deposit? That's the same thing. What interest rate, this is a trick question, what interest rate is associated with a lease option contract? Can an option payment, remember that's the amount uh, up front, can the option payment be too low or too high? Next slide. Uh, Steve, please. Okay, thank you. What determines the option price? What determines the lease payment? What conditions does rent to own violate? If lease option is okay, is lease purchase okay? Is rent to own okay? How is lease purchase different from lease option? Lease purchase different from lease option? And again, why does this work, or why might this work for a manufactured home when it might, might not work for a site built house? So we'll come back to these questions. Carl and I will go over all of them. Uh, obviously, we'll take other questions from you. Um, but uh, I'm going to turn the floor over to uh, Carl at this point. He's going to go through his slides. I have to love that first slide because that's that legal ease that you get at the bottom of anything and everything that you have it says uh, essentially if you're going to get legal advice you need to go to your particular state because what i'm going to be telling you about is really uh, from a 747 type of level and when you are working in any particular state any particular state's laws are what's going to apply so uh, that's just, you, you can pass past that if you want to, and um, go to the next slide, we'll get into that then next. But I always have to start out with a couple of attorney jokes, because I think I'm the only attorney speaking uh, at this particular conference. And uh, so what do you call a thousand attorneys at the bottom of the ocean? A good start. A good start. Uh, <laughs> it's, not, it's an old goody. How about this one? What do you call a room full of attorneys with concrete up to their necks? Foot too short. Not enough concrete. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, uh, so as a uh, disclaimer, I mean this this is uh, information that's real general, uh, and it is particularly information that I presented previously to the Indiana Manufactured Housing Association. Uh, uh, community conference several years ago and it's been updated a little bit but essentially we're going to start with and, and you'll see DFI that's the Department of Financial Institutions in our particular state now, every state's going to have uh, some type of uh, organization uh, within their state government that's going to provide the same sort of regulation and enforcement well, it's that enforcement, which is always the big question. How much funding are they going to have to actually go out and do the uh, audits and enforcement and enforce penalties? Because as we all know, it's really all about money. So all you got to do is follow the dollars. Uh, here we say a lease with an option to purchase is by definition an agreement where the title to the property is not transferred. All right? So in these situations, as the community owner, you are going to hold on to that title. You're not putting a security interest on the title, but you are holding on to the title. And in our particular uh, state, and I think in a few other states that I've talked to, uh, their financial institution departments have taken the enforcement position that there is no transfer of title uh, and MLO licensing which is what these gentlemen were also mentioning, is not required as long as you are using a true lease with an option to purchase. All right? And the question becomes, what is a true lease with option to purchase? And you have to be very careful to make sure that you're not simply taking a retail finance transaction and disguising it as a lease with option to purchase. And there are certain technicalities. We're going to go through those hopefully fairly quickly so that we have a lot of time to go through the questions that Spencer threw out 
because I think that's just more the practical application. And what I really want to do is go through these things so that you sort of see how difficult it can be to really determine when a particular contract is or is not a loan finance transaction or truly a lease with option to purchase. So the next slide. So you do need a lease. Even though you're holding on to the title, you're not creating a security interest, all right? And if you simply keep the title to ensure payment, then you still have a security interest and not a lease. You really are, this is a true lease. You're holding on to the title because you are the owner of that home up until the point in time when you transfer that title over to that less so, uh, lessee who eventually will become the purchaser of the home. Real technical type of stuff. So, uh, and once again, if it's not an actual lease, that's where they're going to come in and say, hey, you're doing a, you're doing a finance transaction. You need to be MLO uh, licensed. And then you're going to get hit with all sorts of different things. So next slide. So uh, under Indiana law, and Indiana is uh, not real clever. Uh, we're, we're just a bunch of Hoosiers. So um, no, no offense, Glenn, if Glenn's in here or anybody else. So, um, but we bought, beg, borrow, and steal a lot of our law from other states. And so uh, I believe some of this bright line test and the meaningful residual test that we're going to get to actually comes from various other states. So you're going to see these exact same sort of concepts, maybe not the exact same terminology, but the same concepts in almost every state in the union. So when you have a contract, you first need to look at it and you most first do the bright line test. And a contract is not an actual lease if the tenant cannot voluntarily terminate the contract. So you always want to have a true lease. You have to have somebody being able to have an opportunity to terminate that contract. It can be with a penalty. So you might have a five year lease and you can have a penalty on the termination, but it can't be so severe of a penalty that you're creating a complete uh, uh, disincentive to ever terminate the contract. So you gotta kind of play with the numbers there a little bit. So you've gotta have cannot voluntarily terminate the contract and, next slide, then you've got, I just, this is wonderful, it's always so difficult. One of the four following conditions exists. The original term of the contract is equal to or greater than the remaining life of the home. So if you've got something that you're gonna run out the uh, value of the home uh, for any particular real use, then uh, that would meet that condition. The next condition is the tenant must renew the contract, must, you have an obligation to renew the contract for the remaining life of the home or become the owner of the home. So you really don't, once again, that kind of goes to the uh, uh, idea of being able to terminate because if you have to do that, then you're not really giving them an opportunity to terminate. Next slide. The tenant has an option to renew the contract for the remaining life of the home but must pay no additional payment. Well, at that point in time, you're really not buying anything because the value of the home that you're selling to them is not really of any value. Next slide. And the tenant has an option, or, or this is an or, the tenant has an option to become the owner of the home for no or no nominal additional payment. Somewhat similar to the previous one. Next slide. So, if you've got both of those situations, it is not an actual lease. And you have to be MLO licensed. Now, we went through that very quickly. There was a lot of technical information. You can give that to any attorney in Indiana and it's going to take them 45 minutes to go through that and get it figured out. We're going to have that information available on Spencer's website so that you can download it. Talk to one of my friends here and uh, he said, oh, when you first gave that to me, I had to sit down and really absorb it. So it's not something you're going to get right now, but you do want to go ahead and get this information because I think it is something that's going to be helpful. All right, so let's go on. If you then, all right, so you go on to the meaningful residual interest test. So let's say you have uh, what you think is a lease. Then you have to go to the next test, which is the meaningful residual interest test. 
can the park owner at the end of the contract term reasonably expect to receive back a home that has value? You saw Spencer's example, and he had the option price at $9,000. So we've got a $40,000 home, 10 years of depreciation, it hasn't depreciated to no value, it still has value of at least $9,000. So if the lessee, that tenant, is going to say, no, I don't want to buy that home, and they have that option, then that home will come back to you as a community owner, and you still have a home that has value. So it's that whole idea of, let's say you took that lease with option to purchase, uh, in the example that Spencer gave and took it out 20 years. Well, at that point in time, you're, you're not going to have anything worth much at that point in time, so you're not going to have a home that has any value. So if you do get something back, then you have an actual lease, lease, and if no, then that contact does create a security interest. Next slide, please. And in evaluating uh, whether the park owner can expect to receive back the home, does the contract contain an option to purchase for no or nominal payment? And next slide. Uh, does the tenant develop equity in the home? Now that is one of those that it's really going to be on a case-by-case -case basis, and you're not going to be able to make a clear determination because those are the sort of things that people argue about in court, which you never want to get to. If you've really developed an equity in the home, then you're not going to have an actual lease. So next question, the next slide. Uh, if yes to both questions, it is not an actual lease with option to purchase. Next slide. All right, so keeping the title, it can only be looked at as a means to secure payment under the contract, you must be MLO licensed. Um, that's the risk, so is that confusing? Yeah, I mean, absolutely confusing. So that's where when you get into this, it's real important for you to make sure that whatever contract you end up using is one that you've had your particular uh, state attorney, whoever you might use, um, take a closer look at that. One of the things that you are going to have to have if you have it correct, at least with option to purchase, and this is, even though it's all technical, this, is, this can be a simple process. I, I do want to stress that. So this is more the, the scare tactic of how specific it can be, and you don't want to just use any contract that you find out there on the, uh, on the internet. So the reg M segregated disclosures, you know, lease with option to purchase. Uh, we'll go through these fairly quickly. Uh, next slide. So uh, you have various reg M, all right? So under lending, you've got reg Z, and you've got various disclosures. Under a lease, you have Reg M disclosures. Next slide. And once again, if uh, not used in the correct way with the Reg M disclosures, uh, looking at my friend, uh, then the property will place itself at risk during an audit and uh, for potential lawsuits based upon consumer protection laws. Those are various different laws that are going to be under your state in particular, uh, and usually. Consumer fraud is usually the one that each state has some type of consumer fraud. Next slide, please. So there are various specific disclosures that must be provided, and those are as such. Amount due at least signing or delivery. We'll go through this very quick. The total amount to be paid prior to or at consummation or by delivery, if delivery occurs after consummation, using the term amount due at least signing or delivery, in quotes, literally in the regulation, in quotes. So that's why you're going to actually see that uh, in that fashion on an actual contract. The lessor shall itemize each component by type, the amount, including any refundable security deposit, advanced monthly or periodic payment, and capitalized cost reduction. If you can flip through a couple of slides there. That's real simple, isn't it? It can be. It can be once you end up knowing exactly what you're actually going to be putting there. And that's what hopefully uh, Spencer and I can kind of clarify for you. Next slide. You have to set out the payment schedule and total amount of periodic payments. Next slide. Other charges. Usually you're not going to have other charges. 
This is under Reg M, but under our situation and our circumstances, you're rarely going to have other charges. Next slide. Total of payments that are going to be paid during the life of the lease. And that can include such things as utility payments and such that might be within the framework of your lease. Purchase option is the next one. One more slide. So this is where we get into the very specifics about this is a statement of whether or not the lessee has the option to purchase the lease property and you need to set down that purchase price. Now the determination of the purchase price is what we'll also discuss in this moment. And then we have the last statement of referencing, statement ref referencing non-segregated disclosures. You're going to see that at the bottom of your Reg M, that if you want to look at anything else, you need to look at the rest of the contract. Now, I think that's the end of my, yeah, okay. So, uh, if you'll leave that up so that I can have, uh, you and I can have uh, Mark, on it. that'd be great. Okay. <laughs> so, has everybody in here has uh, purchased a home or purchased a car? Is that correct? Uh, financed? And you've got that one box, especially when you buy a home, that shows you what your interest rate is and what your total payments are, and you never want to look at that, but your total payments on a $200,000 house on a 30-year mortgage get up into the millions of dollars, right? Probably a million or so. That's the type of disclosures that we're talking about. It's in a segregated box, and I don't know if you can see this very clearly, but it is that same sort of disclosures that you're going to see on your car financing, or in your home financing. And that's what you're looking for when you have an appropriate lease with option to purchase contract. And it's within the framework of these disclosures that you're also going to get in to the various terms that Spencer initially mentioned, which is the option, option payment, option price, lease payment, and the term. So those are some of the other things that are going to be in there. So, Spencer, I think we're at 315, so we've got about a half an hour. So if you want to start going through those questions, I think that's probably the best way if you want to throw those back up. All right. So um, you want to, and then with that, you want to sit down here so we sure. both have a mic. That was amazingly illuminating. It's getting late today. These work. Yeah. All right. So um, let's go ahead and start with that first question that you have. Do you have those? Here, here. I got them right there. I got it. I, I can manage this. I'll just use this one. All right, our first. Okay, yeah, there it is. Uh, what is the status of the resident during the lease term? Buyer, borrower, or something else? Let me ask you a question. How many think the status of the, what are we talking about, the resident here? The resident. Is the resident the buyer? Let's see a show of hands. How many think the resident is a buyer during the lease option contract? That's right. That's right. Yeah, and Mario thinks the buyer. Okay. They will own it at the end, so they have the purpose of buying it. Okay. There's Mario's argument. Uh, how many think they're a borrower? How many don't think at all? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we had buyer, we had borrower. Uh, what other possibilities? What other uh, classifications? Say what? A renter. A renter. How about a tenant? Yeah, yeah there you go. No, no, no problem. Okay, I like that. So we, we, we're talking about this, and I think that uh, you want to be very careful in how you phrase this when you talk to anybody about this. I, I was uh, in house with a finance company for five years, and I had to change the entire uh, lingo around the entire 
uh, company. We had 600 employees and everybody called everything loans. Loans, 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 loans. Well, what we were doing was not lending any money at all. It was all retail installment sales contracts. And nobody wanted to say retail installment sales contracts, but that's what we were doing. And I ended up having to change that whole nomenclature that we used in every one of our collection letters, every one of our letters that went out, every one of our billing statements, all of those things had to be changed. And the reason was because we wanted to make sure that we were using the correct terminology just in case we ever got audited by any particular state. We started out in 23 states and ended up in 40 states. So with that being said, you are, might think that in practicality you are a borrower. Uh, and, but you're certainly not a borrower because a borrower is somebody who literally gets money and then uses it. So you're not even a borrower in a retail installment sales contract. You're just buying something you know, over time. Uh, so in this situation, they're neither a buyer, borrower, or lender B, it's something from hand, but uh, it's something, there we go. But anyway, uh, not a buyer or a borrower, you really are just a tenant. Now, in practical terms, what are you looking at this tenant as? You're probably looking at the tenant as a buyer, but you really need to look at them as a potential buyer. Not necessarily a confirmed buyer because they always have the option to terminate their contract. Would you say that's correct? Absolutely. Yep. All right. So with our next question, what is the status of the community owner during the lease term? Well, I think we've probably kind of answered that. Is it a seller or a lender? And once again, it's neat. All right. You are the lessor, you're the landlord, uh, and you do not, you are not a seller. They have that potential to be a seller in the future once that option is exercised. But until that option is exercised and the sale actually occurs, you are not a seller. And you're certainly not a lender because you have not given any money to the um, to the tenant to purchase anything. Any comments on that, Spencer? No, I think you covered it. I agree with you. All right. Is the option payment a security deposit? How about hands in the air for people who think that the option payment is essentially essentially a security deposit? Hands in the air that agree with that. That's a really important point. Uh, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times we've uh, gone to court. Fortunately, uh, not, not as many as you might uh, think because our default rates are fairly low. But it's not uncommon for someone in an eviction hearing to tell the judge that they paid X amount of money up front and they should get their security deposit back. And unfortunately, some magistrate judges uh, don't understand the difference between lease option and some of these other uh, to, you know, terms, if you will, of financing, alternative uh, uh, financing. And sometimes, unfortunately, magistrate judges uh, agree with them. And sometimes we have to go beyond the magistrate judge to a higher court. Um, uh, somebody was asking me this morning how we handle situations like that. And if we get any indication whatsoever that the tenant is likely to claim that they should get their security deposit back, and also in any indication that the magistrate judge might not understand that we are represented by an attorney. We will spend the $300 or so to have an attorney represent us at the eviction hearing because an attorney can usually convince the judge that this is not a security deposit and that they should not get it back. And remember what I said in the first place when we were talking about terms, what this person is paying is a fee the option payment is the fee paid up front to be able to buy the house at a certain price at a certain point in time in the future. And that is a one-time fee that the tenant pays for that right. They're not entitled to get it back. And so you are buying something. You are literally buying, an, instead of buying a pen, right, this is tangible property. We all know that. You know, the homes that we have outside, those are tangible property. 
We all understand what intangible property is. It's like a stock share, all right? When you buy a share of stock, that's called intangible property because you can't physically hold on to it. When that person is buying, when they buy that option, when they give you that $4,000 up front, they are buying an intangible piece of property that gives them a right. Just like the stock share is a right to partial ownership of a business, that option that you have purchased for $4,000 is a right that you can then utilize or not utilize later on at the end of that 10 year term that we used as the example. Now, another thing about the option payment versus the security deposit is in a number of the contracts that I've written, because it is a true lease, when you have a simple lease, aren't you usually going to have, when you, when you lease a home and you're just leasing for a year, or even on a month to month lease, you usually require a security deposit, right? I mean, usually you get your first month uh, rent or first and last month rent and the last month rent is the security deposit. Well, when you have that contract and you have the lease, such as the one that I presented a couple years ago to the Indiana Manufactured Housing Association, it had a security deposit separate and apart from the option payment. So at that point in time, you take that contract into the magistrate and say, no, judge, no, here's the security deposit, here's the option payment. We, re we follow all the state rules with regards to use of the security deposit and sent them a letter that said, here's your security deposit back and things along those lines, you know, minus the cleanup fees or what have you. So that's another way that you might be able to create another argument and defense to any magistrate who doesn't quite understand the situation. Okay. Uh, here's the trick question. What interest rate is associated with the Lease with option to purchase. Zero. Zero. Zero interest. Okay. Any other ideas? Any other ideas? How might an interest rate apply to a lease option transaction? Suppose you were borrowing money from American Commerce Bank to buy the house and you were paying them 7% interest. How might you use interest to estimate, not to determine, but to estimate the amount of the lease payment? I'll answer my own question. Um, if you lease something, obviously one of the things that you want to do when you determine that payment is you want to take into account the costs that you might have with a default. If you're leasing this to someone, your cost of funds in that example is 7%. But there is some likelihood that that person is going to default. And if they do, you're going to get the house back. You're going to incur rehab costs. It's going to sit there for a while. You're going to be able to sell it, maybe at the balance of it on it, maybe for less. So all of those are default-related costs that you, as a landlord, would want to take into account when you determine that monthly lease payment. And in our case, what we do is estimate that monthly payment at about 3% over our cost of funds. So if I'm paying 7% to borrow the money, I'm going to calculate that payment at about 10%. I won't necessarily use that exact amount. I may use a little bit more, a little bit less. But, but whoever said there is no interest rate on a lease option payment is correct, just as there is no interest rate on renting an apartment. But I think it's clear then that when you're making those uh, business decisions as to determine what your payments are, you as the landlord or lessor have to make those sort of calculations using the same concept of an interest rate on that transaction. Right. Right. So it, it, you just don't want to make sure that you're, you're never putting that out there that there's an interest rate associated with that, at least with the option of purchase to the tenant. Or right. All right, next question we had was, can an option payment be too low or too high? Remember, the option payment is you not paid up front. So could it be too low or too high? 
Now, in our uh, example, that was the $4,000 on the $40,000 home, which I believe my math is correct, that's 10%. Probably right. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> it, it, that's not how that came up. It wasn't a 10% down. No. no. No, absolutely not. Okay, so what we're looking for with that uh, payment is we want it to be enough that someone is not likely to walk away. So from a practical business point of view, I know that if I make that option payment really low, if it's nothing more than what they pay as a security deposit on an apartment, for instance, which is probably one month's rent, five or $600, then I know that they're not very likely to, to stick with the deal. So in the same sense that a lender, and we're not a lender in this case, but some of the thinking is the same, in the same sense that a lender wants somebody who makes a loan to have a substantial amount invested in the transaction, and therefore is less likely to walk away from it. I want this person who uh, is, is entering into this contract with us to be motivated to stick with it. So I want that payment to be uh, substantial. Uh, consequently, I wouldn't set it too low. What if I'm setting it too high? Suppose I had somebody come along and they were willing to pay $30,000 up front. And uh, on my $40,000 example, they wanted me to essentially finance the remaining 10000 And I would say to you that that's not reasonable. Um, and a judge, I think, would say it's not reasonable. Yeah, I, and that, that's, that's where you're getting into the risky waters. And even though um, I know that some states have been willing to give uh, opinions as to whether a particular contract is acceptable or not, those contracts, just like the one that I presented to the Department of Financial Institution of Indiana, they said, well, this looks fine, but until it is completed with numbers and I am able to look at what the numbers were, $4,000, $9,000, the, the, the lease payment, I'm not going to be able to make a determination whether or not it is meeting those particular bright line tests and those meaningful residual tests. So one of the risks when you do something where you go 10% down, uh, that looks like a, that looks like a retail installment sales contract. And even though we have that as the example, I think I might recommend maybe not using an exact 10%. I think I'd want to use something that's a little bit different than that. Uh, and have a means of, well, how'd you come up with that? Well, we, we usually do about three, four thousand dollars down. And have those contracts always be somewhat inconsistent, uh, you know, because what you're doing is you don't want to fall into that category of being a lender, which, you know, even when you do things all correctly, uh, that's not to say that some magistrate might say, well, I don't agree with you. I think this is something different. But the, the only other way that you're going to be able to put these homes in your park is to be MLO licensed, and that is a whole mess. That is a mess. Absolutely. All right. So uh, what determines the option price? Option price. That's the amount that someone buys the house for at some point in time in the future. Anybody got a suggestion? Fair market value at that time. Right. Write down FMV. Fair market value. At the time that the option is being exercised. So in that situation, it's not when you buy the option, which the home was worth 40000 in our example. It is the value 10 years later, which normal depreciation would bring that home down to the $9,000 fair market value. Right, right. And, and that's one of these uh, kind of nuances of our industry. It's one of the times, I think, where the perception, whether it's correct or not, of a manufactured home depreciating over time, depreciating very quickly compared to a site built house, actually works in our favor. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Sure. Isn't that 
Well, the option the payment, payment, right? The option fee, isn't that somewhat market-driven based on different markets? So Spencer, in the market that he's in, I think it's more properties in this area, one part may be in an area where the social economic income and people are higher, therefore he might be able to get uh, 3500 down, but in another market, he may not Somebody who's only going to have $1,000 or maybe even 500 to put down. That's right. So but not put down to purchase that option. Right. So I'm saying that's just for other people too. That's a little bit of, of estimating that is you don't want to cut off the sales because you'd like to have 4000 but you're not in the market that supports someone walking in. Yes, on this option or so much. So, so one of the things that you do when you have a situation like that is you, you take a look at that and you say, all right, at the end of the contract, when they are going to exercise that option, there's going to be ways that you are going to give some credit, and you have that ability to give some credit to such things as the $500 payment, all right? And maybe uh, because you have uh, it's not an exact science when you get down to depreciation over 10 years. Maybe that home is really only worth 7000 in your mind rather than 9000 And you've given $500 down, and so now you've got only $6,500 left. And the payments were, what would be in your example, three fifty. Four fifty. dollars 450 So if they were making those 450 payments, at the end, when they exercise that option, and you hand them the title, and you say, you have now purchased yourself a home, but you still owe me $6,500, and they sign an unsecured promissory note, because it's gotta be unsecured at that point in time. But they've been living there for 10 years, <laughs> all right? And we know how expensive it is to move a home. So, you're going to have that unsecured promissory note still at a $450 payment, which, quick math, is about 18 months. So they're just going to keep making that $450 payment, and in their mind, they're still just paying for the home, whereas the reality is that they already own the home. They just owe you some money. Now in Indiana, what we have is things like innkeepers, liens, and things along those lines. So you also got your lot lease going. So there's other security that you have and still having that home in your park. Okay, well, would you agree with that, Spencer? I, I would, but let's, uh, let's go back over that. Carl covered a lot of territory very quickly there. In our example, this person at the end of a 10-year lease could buy the house for $9,000, and we were willing to give them credit for the 4000 that they paid up front. So obviously, they would owe at that point $5,000 more, right? Now, most of the people we deal with uh, may come up with the initial payment, the option payment. But what happens when Mr. Smith comes to you at the end of 10 years and he says, I know I owe you $5,000, but I don't have $5,000. So what if you, at that point, finance the house for him? You say, well, Mr. Smith, you've been paying me $450 a month, you owe $5,000 more, I'll finance that for you at zero interest over the next 12 months. You know, I think that works out as it was at $433 a month. Um, so suppose you did that. You said, wow, I, you know, you paid me all this time, I think you're, you're good for it. Uh, I'm going to finance this for you, and all you have to do is pay me $433 a month for the next 12 months, and I'm going to give you the title. What will you have done at that point in time? If you're, and, if, and in that situation, you're saying you're not going to give the title until the end of the 12 months. I'm saying, what if somebody holds on to the title? Right. right. <coughs> you are doing financing. That is exactly right. You will have originated the mortgage at that point. Because a mortgage, remember, is a credit transaction where you hold security interest in the asset. In general. So what you would otherwise do is you would give them that title in that scenario and say, you're good for it, I know, 
I'm going to go ahead and give you the title because that's what the contract says I'm going to do. You still owe me the five thousand, but I'll let you pay that five thousand. Just keep making that payment for the next twelve months on this full unsecured promissory note, and you have not at that point created a retail installment sales contract. It's just a payment, and they have the title. They can walk away. They can they can take that home and they can sell that home at that point in time. They own it. Everybody understand that? I know that's a little complicated, but that, that is one of the nuances of this transaction. Let's get the question. Let's get the question from Wayne back, and then we'll come up to you. The yeah. one, one Wayne back. Barbara, I think. Commercial, and then at least, and 
possibly more hit at time with you than in the festival thing uh, with a security interest. But how do you have a security interest? In other words, usually you also have an example. Uh, we get 4,000 down and 450 or 500 a month and say that the end of 10 years or 12 years or whatever the union of the improvement is painful. Uh, and you've got to work your, uh, you know, some sort of uh, percentage increase on lockdown or something, but uh, try to really simplify the lease. And by titling the unit that the customer's name, if you have a situation where a 600 pound person steps through a heat vent and breaks both his legs, you're out of the suit. The only concern. And the main concern with everything that you talked about there is you said security interest. You said security interest, and that immediately says that's a retail installment sales contract, which means you have to be MLO licensed. That's, that's the problem with that situation. I completely understand what you're saying, but to do that, you have to be MLO licensed. That is what they have told us, not only in Indiana, but I know several other states have said that. And so and you cannot have a security interest because that is pushing into the rule that would be under the Dodd-Frank and the Safe Act. So yeah, I mean, yes, I agree. If we could just go back to before 2010, because uh, the real difficulty with what happened under that Dodd-Frank Act is that that was going after the people who were doing those uh, mortgages on, uh, you know, uh, like what's the term, you know, uh, aggressive, predatory, thank you, predatory financing. We got swept in with it. There was no reason for us to be in that act. We should have been sliced out. And if there's anything that could happen, if we could get ourselves sliced out of that, then we could go back to just doing the mom and pop retail installment sales contract, here's your title, here's your contract, boom, we're, we're done. That would be the best of all of us. So, uh, okay. you had another question right there. Yes, sir? Um, I was going to ask you about uh, repairs and maintenance, uh, and whether there's any benefits in doing these two as it relates to repairs and maintenance uh, within the home versus Uh, you were asking if the tenant can be held responsible for the maintenance of the house. And, and I, was, I would say, and I just ran into this with the Iowa, is that is a state-specific uh, issue. In Georgia, for instance, there's nothing to prevent us from holding the tenant responsible for the insurance, the taxes, and the maintenance. Um, but in Iowa, for instance, I found out recently that the tenant cannot be held responsible. So that is certainly one of those things you have to check. In state specific, again, in Indiana, you can make them responsible contractually. Uh, so you're going to have to take a look at your own state. And so in Indiana, I'm like, yeah, push it off to them. No problem. Sales tax is another state specific issue you need to be careful about. I saw Bill Cook over here. Uh, this is really a you know, the sky is falling, chicken little sort of thing. I know in Georgia there's been zero lawsuits that involve lease options or um, installment contracts. Zero. Do you know of any court case anywhere that's come under Dodge Frank or the Safe Act? Well, um, when you say zero, I agree. Zero as far as lease option, but there are many people who disregarded the SAFE Act and Dodd Frank and continued to do installment sale contracts without holding MLO licenses who got fined or penalized one way or another. We have had, uh, in Indiana, they went through two different phases where uh, the only thing I can figure out is they got the funding for the auditors. And it was there at the beginning, probably back in 2011, there was a sweep of audits where people who were still not uh, following uh, the MLO were still using retail installment sales contracts had to go back and redo a whole bunch of contracts and get their current contracts up to snuff, which ended up, you know, they got to hire the attorneys and get everything done and then go back to their uh, tenants and redo all those contracts. Uh, and then we had a second sweep 
I think it was about two years ago, Glenn, where they uh, came through again. And, and so what they do is they do spot audits and they'll try to pick uh, particular parts that they know uh, might have some issues. And so has there been a lawsuit brought by an individual in a state court in Indiana? No. Has DFI on two different occasions come out and done the audits and caused problems? Yes. So in Indiana, and I'm not familiar with there is nothing under Dodd-Frank, nothing under MLO, nothing under uh, consumer fraud on an individual basis. Is that, and I, I, I really don't keep track of uh, I, do, I just know a lot of people that are still doing over financing, and I mean, nothing's happened anywhere that I know of, and there's been no court case where the government descends and goes, well, and it's not like people are scared, I give Chicken Little, but oh. fact, nothing's happened. I, 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 you know, that's the practicality. That's the risk assessment that any community owner has to make. Uh, do you want to do it right, or do you want to take risk? And if you're going to take risk, you know, sometime in the future, you might get nabbed. And if you've got 25 contracts out there, and suddenly you've done all of them incorrectly, and they get together, and they come after you because somebody's finally got a lawyer, uh, brother-in-law, who takes a look at it and says, well, what the hell, that, that, that's no good. And then he goes around and does a little class action with the 25 there and the 40 in the next part, the 40 in the next part, and suddenly you're spending defense fees of forty, fifty thousand dollars to essentially avoid something that you could have nipped in the butt. It just it's insurance in in a sense to do it the right way. Yes, yes, sir. Regarding that, then why wouldn't you just hire a 